All right, now I'll film this one. Coming up next on Rugby Wrap-Up, rugby author Jamie Wall. Rugby Wrap-Up brought to you in part by The Balanced Palette, nutrition for peak performance. And The Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street, the world's best rugby pub. Hey everybody, welcome back to Rugby Wrap-Up. Matt McCarthy at the Fantasy Sports Network Studio 34 in New York City. And we are going ac across the globe, ladies and gentlemen. This is global rugby coverage, sometimes with a wink. And we have encompassed all of that in this particular segment in week 103 of the show with none other than Mr. Jamie Wall. Yes, you recognize that name because he's... He's written for Rugby Wrap-Up when we had good stuff on the on the website. And <laughs> Jamie is down in New Zealand. Jamie, welcome. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me on, man. It's a real pleasure. Listen, it's not every day that we have a rugby novelist on the show. Oh, I wouldn't call myself a novelist because uh, everything that I've written uh, in, the, in the book we're going to be talking about is actually true, so... Call my, I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to call myself an author right now, so that, that's as far as I go. But a rugby novel, that, that, that's a novel idea. Nonetheless, this is an accomplishment. And I had Bryce Campbell on the show earlier, uh, and I had about a thousand reasons why I was jealous of him. You have also raised the bar here with the novel thing, or the book thing. Yeah, I have. And, uh, and once again, thanks very much for, um, for making mention of it. Um, it's called Brothers in Black. Uh, it's a it's a story of the long history of brotherhood and the and the and New Zealand rugby, um, focusing on brothers who've played for the All Blacks. And what I wanted to do was write a, a history of the team that people in New Zealand and around the world could enjoy, and and do it within the framework of of the brothers who have played. Because if you look back over history, there's been brothers involved in pretty much every major event, match, uh, uh, you know, thing involved involving the team. And I thought it would be just a really cool way to tell that story. First point that I want to make is you had me at primordial ooze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I like that phrase, that turn of phrase. Uh, and I think that every, it's something that every rugby nation around the world has had, uh, has had, which is that you know everything had to start somewhere. It started in the U.S. It started in Australia. It started in South Africa. And the, I've tried to tell the story of how it started in New Zealand because it started off uh, with a set of four brothers who, who represented New Zealand on a tour way back in 1888. So I thought that was a good place to start. Is this the Warbricks? Yep, there was four Warbricks. Joe Warbrick, who was the main brother of the four, uh, is now in the International Rugby Hall of Fame uh, for his exploits that you can read about in that chapter. Um, it's a crazy, crazy story. Um, it was basically about a tour uh, to the British Isles that lasted well over a year, and they played something like 130 matches and had to deal with uh, long boat rides and train rides and, and Jack the Ripper and uh, co uh, people dying of cholera all around them. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's insane when you think about how far rugby's come from then. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I made a note that Warbrick is like the perfect rugby name, War and brick, right? Especially for Maori and a rugby yeah. player. Yeah, that's right. And uh, her, their family is actually still uh, very much involved in the game. Um, they're great, great, great. No, oh, maybe grandson and nephew. But they weren't uh, that. William they Warbrick. weren't that great. They weren't that great. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. There, there is one. There is a Warbrick right now uh, playing for the New Zealand Sevens development team. So their their family name is still very strong in the Bay of Plenty region and in New Zealand rugby. All right, so the Winyards, uh, any of them left in the rugby world? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. Um, they're pretty um, prominent in the Wellington uh, rugby setup uh, uh, back in the day, and uh, I think there are still a couple still floating around in the Wellington club scene, yeah. All right, well, I've got a quiz for you uh, on a couple of things in your book, and I yep. want to talk about William Winyard. And I, I yes. think his nickname was Tabby. That's right. All right. Was his nickname Tabby, A, because he was all over the pitch like a cat, like a Tabby cat, right? B, he had been resuscitated eight times from actual near drownings and thus nine lives cat Tabby. 
C, all of the above, or D, none of the above? Uh, I, I, I want to say, I, I think it's D, but I want to say C because um, that, that sounds more interesting. We're going to go with C. We're going to go with C. All yeah. of the above. We're going to go with C. All of the above, yeah. You can look it up and, and get Jamie's book to, to back it up. Uh, who is one of two of the first ever Maori to play for the All Blacks? Oh, that's, well, it's an interesting one. Um, the first Maori player uh, is officially down as Jack Tyro and Joseph Warbrook uh, in the same um, team because the All Blacks list is done alphabet- alphabetically. Uh, Jack Tyro is, is, is generally regarded as the first Maori player. However, records back then are pretty sketchy. We have a, I don't know if you guys use that word here, but we do. Uh, over there, but sketchy uh, is, is the best way to sum up the records um, from from those days. So, yeah, I mean, there's a nice um, photo in the in the book of the first ever New Zealand representative team, who, by the way, didn't wear black jerseys. Um, you can find out what colour jerseys they did wear in the book, but they they still look very smart. Uh, so, yeah, that, that that's the answer to that question, uh, Jack Tyrod. All right. I, I was going to say Joe Warbrick. I said one of two. Uh, oh, so, yes. Oh, yeah. So there was, there, there's two there, but Jack is the first because it's done in alphabetical order. All right. So, so you, you uh, get t, t becomes four W. You get extra credit for that one, Smarty Pants. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to up, mm. up you one on the Smarty Pants thing. I think it was the uh, blue with a gold uh, silver, uh, not a gold silver fern, a gold fern on the jersey was the blue jersey of Otago. That's absolutely right. Yeah, you got that one. Um, it was it was organised by some guys who uh, who were from Otago, so they decided to use their own jersey. But then, about ten years later, that was changed to a black one. All right. Yeah, and you know the thing the thing that caught me most about this book right out of the gate was it's there's so many different firsts or precursors for what is now going on, right? And and mm. yeah, the whole thing about the brothers each each one of these stories of the brothers is more interesting than the next, and it doesn't matter if it was in 1888 or 1889 or 1884 up until the present, you know, with the Barretts. Uh, but you know, the one, some of the things that caught my eye were, were like the precursor to the rugby tour, right? The, the mm-hmm. Warbrick rugby tours were like the precursors to like what we have today of the, the, the rugby 100 club, uh, DB rugby tours, George Hooks, Irish rugby tours, uh, USA Eagles tours, whatever. These guys were doing it. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. And they were pretty much done for the same reasons as the tours you just mentioned, which was to get out, play rugby, meet some people, uh, have a few drinks and make some friends, you know, and and that's a massive tradition of rugby that's come from, what's that, 140 years ago to today. So yeah. it's it's a really nice uh it's a really nice tradition that rugby is is quite quite unique to rugby, you know. And and it's what brings people like me and you together from opposite sides of the globe. Right. And you had you know had the reverse of what the the New Zealand guys were doing trying to go away. You had guys from England coming down and that was the precursor to the British and Irish Lions tours. And it's one thing to lose your captain to an injury. It's another thing to lose him to drowning. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, that, that was on the first ever uh, British Lions tour. Um, the poor uh, British Lions captain, whose name just escapes me at the moment, but um, sadly <laughs> passed away in a boating accident on the way to New Zealand. He, he died in, I think, it was in Newcastle in Australia. So yeah, there was there was a few more. Uh, health and safety wasn't as big a deal back then as it is now, uh, unfortunately for uh, for him. Yeah, you you had some other uh, interesting firsts. I thought the one for locker room fodder, like locker room bulletin board fodder, to try to get the other team and ticked off was the uh, the team up in England when they were playing in Great Britain. Um, the one quote uh, about how the team has ranged from when Captain Cook found them. I think the quote was. The Maoris have certainly progressed since Captain James Cook found the finely painted and neatly tattooed <laughs> ancestors of our visitors eating each other out in the bush. I mean, that, just put that right on the locker room bulletin board for the team to read. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's kind of the way the British, uh, a lot of the British felt about New Zealand uh, back in the day. A lot of them still kind of do, um, which sort of says more about them than it does about us. But uh, I can assure you that 
New Zealand was a far more civilized nation um, by that stage than uh, the, whoever wrote that um, thought at the time. I can't be- I can't believe for the life of me an Englishman would do something like I, I just that just I, it's boggles no, the no. mind. Who, who who would have thought? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, so, I have I, I had no idea. <laughs> but you know, it was kind of barbaric the amount of matches. I think that I, I got a hundred and seven in fifty six weeks. Yeah, that's right. What um, is this? The top fourteen? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think that they they really set themselves some pretty illustrious goals. Uh, uh, the ironic thing about that tour was, even though back then when rugby was still strictly amateur, the the whole point of that was very much to make money, and so they squeezed in just about as many as they possibly could. Uh, and at one stage, they were only down to the absolute bare minimum number of players because uh, they only took twenty six guys with them on that tour. Yeah. So, you know. 26 guys playing 107 games and the vast majority of them playing were only, they only select ever selected the top 15 at the time. So you can imagine just how much of a toll that would have on the body, especially back then when you're playing in what would probably be something like work boots and a dress shirt in something made out of wool. That, that's what it was like back then. If you're ever complaining about the state of your own um, club these days. Yeah, exactly. And there was another one, another, uh, segment or bit caught my eye was um, the English captain having his shorts torn off and Mm. the New Zealand natives team, as they were referred to or called themselves stood by politely to maybe let the guy collect himself and his collect his balls. And instead his teammate just ran and scooped up the ball and took it down and scored a try. That's like the precursor for the Statue of Liberty play in the NFL, which is a ridiculous play. Or like Dean Steincooler of the Nebraska Cornhuskers leaving the ball as a center for one of his teammates to sneak in. Well, I think you're giving the English a bit too much credit there. I don't think they planned it. I think there was just a case of blatant cheating on their part. And then they had a referee who clearly wanted them to win. So it kind of set the tone for what you'd say is Anglo-New Zealand rugby relations for the next, well, up until today, which haven't been the friendliest, I'll I'll put it that way. Well, either way, it was a cheeky play. Oh, yes. (laughs) All right, so uh, where did you write this book, and where did you do your research? Well, I have to put in a massive plug for the New Zealand Rugby Museum down in Palmerston North. Uh, If you're ever in that part 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 of the country, or if you ever come down to New Zealand to watch the All Blacks or whatever, uh, please, please, please give that place a visit because it's a fantastic museum and an amazing resource uh, for anyone who's doing any research for a project like this. Um, the team down there are just really great and really helpful, and they've just got an absolutely invaluable collection of books and programs and stuff you can't find online um, that I, I, I just I couldn't have done this book without. In terms of writing it, uh, I actually, because of my job as a journalist, I actually pretty much did it in my downtime at the stadiums and places that I went to. I spent the summer covering a bit of tennis, um, so ended up doing that up in their nice air-conditioned box up in the Auckland Tennis Centre, uh, and also did quite a bit of it at Eden Park and Waikato Stadium down in, down in Hamilton during the uh, the Sevens League of the, of the World Sevens Series. I spent a bit of time writing it down there, and during a few of the early Super Rugby games, um, got a bit done. Yeah, so it's got a really rich like rugby connection as to where I wrote it. I could look out ap- across the ground and see, you know, the the places of the fields of 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 what I was writing right. about where the where the offence actually happened. So that was pretty cool. I'm 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 pretty happy to that I got to got the opportunity to be, to be able to do that. And we're running out of time, but this thing is chock full of stuff. I mean, it's the stories of brothers, but it's the story of rugby. It's Anybody on the planet can connect with this and all the little anecdotes, which, as you can see, I've got all these post-its full of comments that we can't possibly get to in this show, right? We could talk for hours and hours about this stuff, but what, what were your two or three favorite brother stories? Oh, well, I, I think, uh, you know, my, probably my favorite story to tell, um, being a good Wellington man, uh, was probably the story of Adi and Julian Sevilla. Um, who you guys are probably pretty familiar with over the last few years. Sure. Uh, just about how their how their careers kind of went off in different paths at the moment. And Artie's one is still very much going here in New Zealand. So it's going to be really interesting to see what sort of role he plays uh, in the upcoming World Cup. Uh, and I think just from the old days, uh, the story of Morris and Cyril Brownlee 
who were World War One veterans who came back and played their rugby in the 1920s in New Zealand, which is a very interesting uh, period of time uh, here in New Zealand. World War One is something that we look back on with a, a fair degree of reverence. Um, if I'm not mis- like the same, if I'm not mistaken, Cyril. Yep was the first player to be sent off in an international test match. He was basically the, the first guy to be in the sin bin? He was, yep, the first guy yeah. to ever be sent off. Yeah, uh, the first first All Black. Uh, and that's pretty timely considering what happened with uh, Scott Barrett, who's another brother who's right. uh, played for the All Blacks. There's this chapter on him as well. So, yeah, that's a nice bit of uh, nice connection there. Well, not so nice if, um, <laughs> if you're one of those guys who got sent off, but... You know, it's it's interesting that every All Black that's been sent off has had a sibling uh, that's also played for New Zealand. You had Cyril and Morris Brownlee, you had Colin and Stan Meads, um, Scott and Bowden and Geordie Barrett, and also Sonny Bill Williams, whose sister Niall uh, represented New Zealand yep. um, and for the women's team. All right, so my final question for you is, which of the Woodmans is really your father? Is it Fred or Carfenna? <laughs> oh, I wish. I wish I could grow a moustache as beautiful as them. They are actually Porsche Woodman's um, dad and uncle. Kaffin is uh, Porsche's, Porsche's father and Fred's her uncle. Uh, she, of course, she is the ah, leading woman's rugby player yes. in, in the world. So she's, uh, she's carried on the legacy that those two guys uh, started back in the early 80s. And she, I talked to her about her dad and her, her uncle, and she was just fantastic. Uh, she's an absolutely amazing athlete and a lovely person and a great help. So uh, I, I couldn't, can't thank her enough. And it should be noted that you kind of hint at at the fact that in the book that you're kind of tortured by being asked whether you're their son, which one of their son. But at the same time, I, I'm going to quote you. They're good-looking men in their 20s sporting two of the best mustaches that have ever been seen in the All Blacks. So it couldn't have been too bad for you to be compared to them. Oh, not at all. Yeah, like I said, two very good-looking men. So, uh, <laughs> you know, she, she and she's carried on it, uh, on with those genes. She's uh, just a, such a lo- lovely person. And, um, yeah, like I said, a great help for me. All right, brother. Uh, I, I thank you. And again, I'm so jealous. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to go out and get this book by Jamie Wall, uh, Brothers in Black. It is just one, t- one, one story after the next that you can share with people and talk about. Uh, but I will say that for all um, our friends in America who do want to buy this book, just just Google it. I think the best site to get it on would probably be uh, bookdepository.com. So if you look it up there, um, just Brothers in Black, and it should be at a pretty handy price uh, over there in America. I'm not sure when Father's Day is for you guys, whether it's been, in, been or gone yet, but um, it's Father's Day coming up in New Zealand. So I think uh, if you've got a dad or, or husband or whoever who likes a bit of footy, then um, it's a great gift idea for them. Well, I would say give it to the females as well because it's it's just a great read anyway. But every great book, Jamie, has a great opening line and a great ending line. And for me, The Great Gatsby until today was my favorite ending line in a book. Here, this is why your book has the best line ever. It's in the acknowledgments, and it goes like this. Special oh, yeah. thanks to Stephen, Stephen Berg and his colleagues at the New Zealand Rugby Museum in Palmerston North, who, whose help was invaluable in researching this product. Thanks also to the team at Allen and Unwin for their hard work making this happen, to Lynn McConnell for his helpful advice and encouragement. I owe a special debt of gratitude to the people that set me on the path to achieving this effort. Marcus Stickley, Alex Van Well, and... Megan Whalen and RNZ Radio New Zealand, Duncan Grieve, Mad Chapman, and everyone at the spinoff, Owen Edwards at the Maori Tel- at Maori Television, and Matt McCarthy at Rugby Wrap Up New York, and the many others who have given me a break over the years. First of all, that automatically catapults you to the top of the list here uh, as favorite <laughs> rugby wrap up guest, but it is co- completely unfounded. <laughs> No, Matt, I have, I have to say, you know, that, that definitely comes from a place of uh, great honesty. I, I, I really, really enjoyed doing uh, work for Rugby Wrap-Up. You guys do a fantastic job promoting uh, the game in the United States, which is not the easiest thing to do, as I found out with a lot of yeah. my research. But I think that um, you guys really gave me a place to find my voice as a writer. And if I hadn't started out uh, doing stuff, with you guys and being able to cover super rugby and international rugby back in the day, I probably wouldn't have gone on the path to being able to write a book right now, which I'm really proud of. So I just want to say thank you. 
uh, to you and everyone who was involved in that website. Um, and hopefully one day we can uh, we can we can do it again um, because I want rugby to be a big thing in the United States, just like everybody else. And uh, you know, I think uh, I like to think that I helped. Uh, people, some people out there perhaps get interested and know a bit more about it. So, you know, Absolutely. thank you very much for that opportunity. Uh, all right. I'll, your flattery is uh, without merit, but I'll take it because that's that's what we do here in New York. Thank you for coming on. Thanks very much, Matt. Appreciate it. And uh, go well, Matt. Go well. And on that note, we are out of time. So on behalf of Mr. Jamie Wall, I'm Matt McCarthy at the Fantasy Sports Network Studio 34 in New York City, signing off.